great, great speaker. We have our first presenter is Dr. Monique Gouchard, who identifies as a Black Tina. Dr. Mo was born on St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Island and raised in the South Bronx. She is an accomplished storyteller, educator, social psychologist, research ethicist, and organizer. Dr. Mo is an associate professor of psychology and deputy chairperson at her alma mater, Bronx Community College. She's a chair of the Bronx Community Research Board. She's also a board member of the CUNY Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies and a founding member of the Public Science Project. Monique was the principal investigator of a $250,000 PCORI grant um, that funded the Community Engaged Research Academy that was in the Bronx. Uh, Dr. Gouchard has 16 years of experience working in partnership with young people, parent organizers, uh, environmental justice advocates, and a community-based research ethicist review board on mutually beneficial research partnerships. Her work pairs theory, lived experience, and robust ethics to redress scientific racism. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce all of you to Dr. Mo. Some of you know her. For those of you who do not know her, you are in for a treat, Dr. Mo. Thank you. Thanks so much, Reverend Dr. Phillips. Um, Agnes, can I share my screen? Yes. Um, while we're figuring this out, can I please ask uh, Jewel, Paulette, Jazzy, Francie, Mia, Diane, Donna and Jay, if they would um, take a moment to go to the participants list and update their names to include their pronouns. Appreciate it. So you just find your name and then you click rename and you can add your pronouns at the end. Can I share my screen now? Uh, you should be able to, I don't know why that's odd. I think you have to make me a co-host first. Uh, yeah, I did make you a co-host. Okay, now I can. Thank you. I was like, what <laughs> is happening? I also have 50,000 um, screens open. Okay, I'm going to try to move us in the cut. Um, please feel free to uh, interrupt me ask me to unpack something if I ever get jargony um, or just unmute yourself and ask me a question. Um, first, I wanna thank Reverend Dr. Phillips. I wanna thank Jeff. I wanna thank um, Agnes. Um, Dr. Phillips has been rocking with me for a while, while, right? I think since uh, 2017, late 2016, 2017. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. She, she yeah. was a facilitator yeah. in our Community Engaged Research Academy that I'm gonna talk about. And then Jeff and other folks from the CTSA were wonderful and kind enough to participate in a community dialogue that we had where we basically brought lots of health systems in New York together to say, show us your best community engagement project and we'll tell you if it's good enough. Um, and so Jeff was really brave um, in that moment and we are just writing about that meeting. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, I would be remiss if I did not thank my colleagues in the Bronx Community Research Review Board. I want to edit something that Reverend Dr. Phillips said. I am the vice chair of the BX Crib, and that is significant and important. I also want to say, okay. yeah, I'm going to talk about what the crib is in a, in a little bit. I also um, want to say that I realize, um, apologies, Agnes, that um, on the curriculum, there were like links for like each class of things that you should review. Um, and the link for the BX Crib links to our former um, community partner, the Bronx Health Link. So I just want to clarify that as of November uh, 2019, 
The Bronx um, Community Research Review Board, Inc. is an independent 501c3 organization, no longer affiliated with Albert Einstein College of Medicine, nor are we affiliated with the Bronx Health Link. Uh, I think that that discussion is pertinent to some things that we're gonna talk about today, right? Um, because here we are, a bunch of community members angry, righteously angry about the way that research is happening in our borough and that we realized that it was important for us to be the ones directing the work that we did um, and not be under the umbrella of other organizations, right? Um, yeah, cool. Shout out to Black feminists, organizers, research ethicists, abolitionists. I'm gonna talk a lot about um, those folks today. The more appropriate link to learn about the BX Crib um, is www.bxcrib.org and it is constantly being updated and changing. Um, for the researchers in the room, I am an untenured person. I have created a citation for this talk. I will drop the link to the citation um, to this entire presentation in the chat. You do not have to take notes. You will have it right after I'm done. And when Agnes and Reverend Dr. Phillips gives me the link, I will also post the link there. I am a public scholar. Every single talk that I give is freely available on Beyonce's internet. Um, that is really important to me, uh, especially in the era of COVID where some people are developing research literacy, right? Trying to discern fake news from real news, all the other stuff. Um, but I also have carpal tunnel from taking notes <laughs> and research meetings. So I'm always like committed to like, just, I'm gonna just share my slides. It's, it's not a big thing. Okay, cool. So yeah, I hope to, it says tonight, it meant this afternoon. I gave a similar talk, at, uh, I had a keynote at UMass Boston uh, doctoral education program, but I'll, so I'll fix that before I share it to you. So I wanna vibe with you this afternoon. I wanna acknowledge that I wish that I was this kind of storyteller, like I would tell a story and it'd be like linear links to the end, but I'm more like this kind of storyteller. Um, I'm gonna rein myself in, but I'm also gonna ask you to rein me in. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to please not be like our sis right here. I want you to raise your hand. I want you to unmute yourself. I care more about answering your questions than I care about getting through my slides. Okay, I want to acknowledge that there is nothing, nothing, nothing. I think um, I'm gonna talk about the kind of researcher that I am. Um, and uh, in, in that framing, I wanna say that um, I disbelieve that new research is the thing that needs to be done. And that's probably a controversial stance to take within this space. But um, I come from overly researched peoples, right? And sometimes I want people to stop before they do new research and make sure that they've mined all the research that already exists. So I wanna acknowledge that I'm probably not gonna say anything that you know scores of black women feminist organizers, researchers, physicians, ethicists have not said before me. Um, and I'm gonna, these are some books that like I pretty much refer to and cite um, all the all the time, especially Dr. Harriet Washington's Medical Apartheid. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, most especially Dr. Bagele Chaliza's Indigenous Research Methodologies. Um, but also I love to read the memoirs of black women organizers, stuff like that. All right, so these are some stuff that I'm gonna recommend that Agnes and Reverend Dr. Phillips share with you so that you can also do some reading, um, more reading, right? Um, yay, so yes, Dr. Phillips um, introduced me. I'm gonna reintroduce myself. Um, so I clarify that I am the vice chair of the BX Crib. Um, I'm on the advisory board for the Wild Cornell CTSA. Um, I wish that I were more active, but like the world of academia likes to plan meetings at the same time. And I tried to do that multiple Zoom life. You know, you have more than one computer or your phone and a computer in, in Zoom meetings. And I, I just can't do it. It's just like, it's too much. It's information processing, right? I want to talk to you as a researcher and an organizer, definitely. But I also wanna talk about being a Bronx resident who is not a Bronx patient and how that is pertinent to us talking about community perspectives um, in the grant review process. Okay, so yeah, I first wanna say that I am a reluctant ass researcher. I'm a reluctant researcher. Let's be real, let's be open and honest. Uh, Dr. Linda Tuhiwai Smith, who's a Maori um, scholar writes uh, that research is a dirty word to indigenous people, right? Research overlaps with colonization, with chattel enslavement, 
with land theft, with indigenous genocide, right? Um, so I am a, a very much a reluctant researcher, but I'm a researcher, right? So we'll talk about that tension. And I'm sure that as um, members of this class, you probably have that kind of tension too, right? Um, cool. So I, you know a lot about me, a little, little bit about me. Um, can you tell me a little bit about you? I did not ask Agnes to program these questions in advance. So I'm just gonna ask you in the chat to say A, B, C, D, or E. So please drop an A in the chat. If you're a member of the CRA 2021 cohort, if you're a faculty member at Wild Cornell, drop a B. If you are a physician or a nurse, a C. If you are a member of the CTSA, a D. And if you are other, oh my God, I love other people. If you are other, <laughs> could you please drop an E? I'm just gonna go to the chat and, or Agnes can tell me what people say. Let me put my at the bottom. Okay, I have an E from Jeresha. Lula said a C, Diane A. Uh, Mia A, Jewel A, Jazzy A, and Donna E. Okay, thank you. Yay for others. Okay, so I'm, I'm talking to a mix of folks. Yeah, That's helpful e. to know. You said who else is an E? Paulette. Okay. Yeah, shout out Paulette Spencer. It's my people's. Cool. Um, so I'm asking you another question, and this one I'm going to slow down and read to you. So I'm supposed to talk about community perspectives and research. I wanna check in to see what that means to you, right? Like, what does it mean to include community perspectives in research? Is that a diversity and inclusion pro uh, process on IRBs? I know you read about IRBs, right? These institutional review boards that review the ethics of a study before any researcher, doctor, physician gets to do it. Does that mean there needs to be more black, brown, Asian PI people on an IRB? Does it mean that we need to do a better job in the research, research ethics education um, to include stories of community harm, right? Like I hope you read about the Havasupai people's lawsuit with Arizona State University. I hope you read about the Ralph sisters. I hope you read about the Guatemala STD experiments. So should we fix research ethics education? Um, should we make sure that doctors students and other researchers address racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, fatphobia, ableism, and intersectionality, all those things in research? Uh, does that mean giving more money to community-based organizations? Does that mean we should not only establish um, independent uh, clinical translational science centers, but also like what you're doing, a community research academy? Um, and I think there's an F, I just can't see it. That's like all those things, maybe all those things. So I'm gonna ask for Agnes's help again and tell me what the chat says, just cause I don't wanna open too many windows. No worries, I have two Fs so far. Two Fs, Please. okay. Four. Okay. Five. <laughs> Five. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to agree with you. Um, uh, I, I would say for most of my career, I'm, I'm all about the D and the E, right? Um, as the things that need to be urgently done. But I agree that like F, like all of those things need to happen. Okay. So then now I'm going to ask you a chat question, right? Um, I'm going to ask you if community perspectives mattered in the research grant review process, what would we study? Will we study the same things that we've been studying, right? What should we focus on? Should we focus on individual bodies? Should we focus on systems? Who would be studied if we took seriously the perspectives of community? Okay. What do we got, Agnes? Um, I have a risk. Okay. okay. Um, again, how, about some, how about we lack somebody to be brave and maybe yeah. unmute themselves and speak an answer? 
I said we're going to vibe with each other this afternoon. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Ganlon said community centric. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would agree. This is Jeresha. I, I mean, I would agree. I think it all depends on the community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's some, um, I think, yeah, I just think it all depends on the community. There's some, like, you know, communities that have maybe high blood pressure, mm -hmm. diabetes is, somebody just told me yesterday that their brother has high um, diabetes. Um, that we need to focus on. Um, I mean, I mean, the first thing we need to do, I think you said the body itself. Mm -hmm. Yes, the body is, because we only have one body. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and it, I guess it all depends on what's going on at the time. Okay. So, yeah, so you're saying some really brilliant things, um, Jeresha. I hope I said that correctly. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, I would argue that research should focus on, like, it should be responsive to what is going on in particular communities, right? Like, right. that the community should set maybe the research agenda, right? Right. Right. And, and that, it, should, it should definitely be diverse, you know, diverse. I mean, all ages. Mm hmm I'm not just focusing on, you know, just one set of people mm -hmm. in that research. Yeah, I appreciate you lifting that up too, right? Like uh, Reverend Dr. Phillips said, I, I do a lot of research with young people that's all about empowering them to get that seat at the table. But I'll tell you, Jerasia, that not all adults deserve the presence of young people. They disrespectful. They infantilize them, they're dismissive of them, right? So there's a lot of work that has to be done to create a space where people of different race, ethnicities, cultures, genders, um, all that ages should be able to dwell together. We can't just say here, everybody come, <laughs> right? Like there's a, there's a lot of healing work and a lot of prep work that has to be done to make sure that everyone is respected um, and honored at that. Agnes, you unmuted yourself because you're going to say something. Yes, I just had a comment from Jewel, the perspective of community members as a whole, and she agreed diverse and inclusive. And Diane said, we would study institutions and how responsive they are to the need of service recipients. That's what I'm, Diane, thank you. And Jewel, thank you. I would argue that if community perspectives- on, on Dr. Grishard, that was actually Donna. Oh, I'm sorry, Donna. In the chat but I do have a comment to say after. Go ahead. So I was gonna agree with um, Donna as well, just in that it's important to study the institutions. Many times um, when people are coming to study in our community, they're studying us as the, and they're studying as if we're responsible for what's happening to us without Fact. looking at structure, without mm -hmm. looking at systems. And uh, for me personally, if we're not addressing that, if we're not looking at, um, what systems are in play, how many systems do people have to engage in, and who's studying us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then if it is uh, the people that are researching don't look like us, mm -hmm. then we have to make sure we include how the absence or their presence or their power impacts that study or the topic that they're studying and why they chose the study, as well as if folks have been um, educated in predominantly white institutions mm -hmm. or with a, 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 a medical mind frame that doesn't acknowledge the whole individual. Oh, thank you so much, Diane, for, for checking me, but also contributing all of the things that you said. I, I think we are gonna vibe together <laughs> this afternoon because um, I'm gonna echo a lot of your sentiments. I'm also probably gonna include something that's controversial. If community perspectives are actually considered important in research, then we should pay community representatives the same thing that we pay academics and physicians to be at the table. Do you know and what that's I mean? what and that's what I was gonna chime in, Monique, and say this is Kawako. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna chime in and say when it comes to community perspectives, we can look at this all in all different ways. Mm -hmm. So here comes the controversial part. Mm -hmm. The biases that all happens 
Mm -hmm. individuals that are coming within, I, I, I get very passionate about stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Individuals that are coming within the community to do this work mm -hmm. are the ones that are, what organizations, even within the community that are getting the funding to do this work. And then who are the people doing the community research work? Is it people from this community or what do we consider in quotes, community? How are these communities being picked for mm -hmm. research to be done? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to make it up. Are we picking the South Bronx for not 62 research to be done there? Mm -hmm. Pick, um, picking the Upper East Side or the Upper West Side to do not 62. How mm -hmm. picking these areas in specific, you know, geography to do all of these various things? Mm -hmm. I'm speaking on this because I hear this all the time as a very active member of my community and community board three. So mm -hmm. these things come. So this goes beyond research. It yeah. So housing, it goes to gentrification and all these various things that happen around, you know, from food to this and that. So these are some of the things that we need to be, we need to um, think of when we're thinking about the community. But then we also, here comes the controversial part. We have to think about the people within our community too, to also be open mm -hmm. to what can help all of us as well. Mm -hmm. So it's like me, I can speak up uh, on behalf of myself. I'm, I'm an African-American person. I can walk to my subway in the South Bronx and somebody can look at me and say, oh, she don't belong here. She has a book in her hand and she's reading. Or if they make a comment, or if I stand by the subway station trying to help people to vote or tell them today is voting, make sure you vote because these laws that are made affects you. Oh, please, you know, those, none of this stuff is gonna matter in my life. But but we're seeing it full force today and all this stuff is happening. Mm -hmm. like now we are sold all the, the deep, um, um, the people who are underrepresented communities are being affected by currently what's happening in the world today. Mm -hmm. Healthcare, et cetera, mm -hmm. huge. But then I remember talking to somebody and saying, why am I going to go vote? None of these things affect my life. But mm -hmm. what? I'm sitting here waiting for a stimulus check etc. Or my aunt and uncle is suffering because they have this underlying condition. So what happens? You understand what I'm saying? So this can be looked at both ways. Yes, it's good with the research, etc. and all the things we think, but there's a lot of, you know, stuff within this pot to be cooked in this soup, like just so much happening. And we all have to just, you know, have that perspective when we're going in within the community to help and have that pat and also be able to look at both sides on why somebody would be not receptive or why somebody will be receptive. Yeah, thank right. you oh, for lifting up those things. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to over talk on you. I have a very uh, short um, comment and this is really coming from a person with like, I don't, I don't know how, how should I say a virgin mind when it comes to research, but um I've always been very like detail oriented, maybe the Virgo and me, you know, be a little bit sloppy too. But um, I've always thought about going to, to the origin. Like if you wanna help someone, then you have to um, not only ask them, mm -hmm. but you have to also observe. Mm -hmm. And you also have to um, feel, try to put yourself in their shoes. So if I was going to, um, do a grant that matter, and it has to be the perspective of the community, then I would go very detailed oriented to, and this sounds crazy, but I would have to go to um, all members of the family. The parents, of course, they can speak on behalf of their children, right? And then um, it will also be conversations. It could be conversations. It could be um, a survey. Um, so we could know what's happening actually in each of the homes. Right. right. And, you know, that will take a, a long period of time, but I think that people will feel like they matter. People mm -hmm. will feel value mm -hmm. when you when you speak to them directly, mm -hmm. when you create a way for them to reach out to you or a space where they can see you. Mm -hmm. And it could be it could be the smallest thing. It, it could be like a um, it could be a table outside the train station. Right. It could it, it could be anything. Uh, that you could imagine that would draw them in that's, that's inviting to really feel and they feel like you really want to help them because it's all about the help part of it. It's like, what do you need? 
Right. How can we help you? So I always think of that one of the, the most, um, you know, the most detailed way of, of knowing that. Mm. You know, these are all like, you know, when I hear folks speak, it's like such a big, it's like the institutions. Yeah, it is that too. But you have to find out what's going on in the homes or what's going in the heart, going on in the hearts and the minds of people. Right. Thank you. Yeah, so Koake, I hope I said that right. And Jazzy, thank you so much for lifting up those comments. I think I'm going to address a lot of those in some ways. Thank you for um, getting us to think about like how researchers engage, right? So much research. I've been a researcher. I'm only 44. I've been a researcher 25 of those 44 years, right? That uh, so much research is down. It's like it assumes that a person with some power is conducting some analysis, some investigation on other people that have less power than them, right? Um, so much research is wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, right? I have a question. I have some hypotheses. I have some findings that I want to confirm quickly, urgently, right? Even though we know there is a 17-year gap between like when a, a something foundational happens and, and in terms of evidence-based practice and when your doctor is a prize of that practice and changes their practices, right? Um, so thank you for Jazzy uh, for getting us to think about slowing our pace a little bit and making sure that we check in. Um, and, and to Koake's point, like I think I'm gonna talk a lot about what research looks like when you love the community in, in many definitions of the term community, right? Because when you love people, you realize that they're gonna internalize white supremacy and you're not gonna be surprised by that, right? When you love people, you know that the experience of racism is gonna impact their worldview. And so you're gonna be patient to help them look at things a little bit differently. I'm sorry, Agnes, you unmuted yourself because you wanted to say something? Yes, yeah, so just to add on to um, what we're discussing Francie said the future is on the shoulders of the youngest members of every community. So I think that adds on onto really impacting others and what you just said about changing perspective. Yeah. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I'm going to touch on something that Kowake said, right? Like I borrow from the Community Campus Partnerships for Health definition of community, right? They say that what, however we're defining community has to be dynamic. It has to be inclusive that there is no one monolithic, all size fits all definition of community, that it should not be defined just by geography, right? I'm a Bronxite through and through. I was born in the US Virgin Islands, but I've lived here for 38 years, right? Um, it can refer to a group, it can refer to people who self-identify by age, by ethnicity, by gender, by sexual orientation, by disability, by illness, by health condition but it can also refer to a group of people who just are together from a common interest or cause um, and a sense that we need to have something that, that puts us all together, right? Um, so thank you for lifting up, thinking about community in very, very, very complex ways. Yeah. Okay. But Diane said that the future um, is on all us. The burden should not be solely on the youth. So contradicts what Franti said a bit, um, um, I don't I don't necessarily think so. I think that what I have learned about research and I think what what the last um, comments are said, can you re remind me of the person's name is again? Uh, Diane said the Diane. Yeah. yeah. So I would say to Diane <laughs> that like we know that research is most un impactful when it's produced in collaboration and we know that research is most impactful. And I think that Koake, Jazzy and Diane said a combination of this when it's intergenerational, right? Yes. You can't That's just rely on one group. Yes. You picked up what I was communicating. Mm -hmm. It has to be intergenerational, right? Um, right. Which is right. Because we also, if we're talking about community and we love the community, we, we can no longer look at it. I'm not going to do mm. anything. I'm going to put it to you because mm. I'm this on that. And then it devalues the wisdom and the elders like we have we are all learning together if we mm -hmm. open our space to and we the 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 key part of it to me is that recognizing that all contributions mm -hmm. are value and are equal not yeah. because the older person said it is more valuable than the young person said it but it's equally but we all need to be in the mix 
yeah, Diane, we all need to engage with humility and love and lots of permutations of love. So I like, I'm gonna skip forward some slides because I felt like, how do I say this diplomatically, right? I think the a thing that happens in spaces like this or on clinical translational science centers or on community advisory boards or whatever is like sometimes quote unquote community members feel like they don't have that much to contribute, especially when the researchers are speaking in ways that they're speaking to audiences of other researchers, right? And they're talking in ways that are not accessible and permit everyone to be involved in the conversation. So I don't have to say this to the wonderful folks that are participating right now from the awesome things that you contributed, contributed, right? But show up as your whole ass authentic self, right? Because that is what Agnes and Robert Dr. Phillips need. They need you to check folks and say, wait a minute, so-and-so is not at the table. We are, we are thinking about a thing, especially when you start reviewing these grants, right? You're gonna think right. about like, who needs to be here that is not? And how can I hold space to honor the contributions and perspectives of that person? I'm sorry, did I talk over someone? No, okay. So yeah, I don't have to say this to this group, right? But research has a racism problem. <laughs> it's a stomach racism problem, right? Um, it, ha it has a racism problem on every single level in the methods, in who is doing research, in its education, in its grant evaluation. Hey, listen, I remember, I will tell you a story where um, we were doing a poster for our research academy, right? And my name wasn't the only name on the poster, right? That we were, an academic poster is like a, a chart that has all the findings of the research on it, right? And so we presented a poster at an area hospital that I won't say the name, and it had everybody in our squad's name on it, right? So we all went to this research presentation and a very high level executive was like, oh, great, your project is over, isn't it cute? So what's next for you? because no one is going to fund or continue to fund you teaching regular people how to do research without researchers. Does that make sense, right? And I, I, I did the thing that black girls do, right? I smiled. <laughs> Even though inside I was hot and I was seething and I was so appreciative of that moment because this person was letting me know that I was doing something very dangerous, right? And make no mistake, be, you being involved and in, in, uh, you having a seat at the table wherein you can interrupt racist, sexist, ableist, whatever research is a very powerful and dangerous thing that needs to happen. I can come back to these slides. Um, I wanna talk more about why community perspectives matter even though I know I'm talking to the choir, right? I'm gonna acknowledge that I'm talking to the choir. Um, a couple of days ago, when was that, Tuesday night? I think Tuesday night. Um, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw held um, a panel um, called Her Dream Deferred when massage noir is a, is a pre-existing condition, Black women's health through twin pandemics, racism and the coronavirus, right? Did anyone check out that talk? No. Okay, I'm gonna get you the link. I'm gonna get you the recording because it was fire, right? It was absolute fire. For folks who don't know, massage noir is a term um, coined by Dr. Moya Bailey. Um, it, the term refers to a particular type of racism. It's racism targeted against black women, right? So they're talking about like what it means to be survive, like be a black woman and encounter racism at ever in education, in courts, in the hospital, wherever you go, in the context of a pandemic, right? It was an amazing, an amazing panel. It was a panel, and the audience had like 500 folks in it, and they were. I recognized the names of like the most famous Black women scholars in it, and they were telling stories about how it didn't matter that they had an MD, a PhD, a ED, a Masters of Public Health. It didn't matter that they had the persistent experience of massage noir that impacted their care, right? 
And this is important because I want to hold space for something that Dr. Crenshaw said during the talk, right? And I'll talk a little bit about Dr. Susan Moore when she said, your, your bedside manner leads to my graveside, right? So again, really important to have community perspectives in that. I don't have to tell you that this Panasonic, right, is impacting our communities more than it's impacting everyone else, right? Uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Phillips called me this morning and we were talking about vaccine reluctance, which is I'm sure something that you have been talking about within the Community Research Academy, right? So we, there's all this talk about why Black, Indigenous, Latinx people are not getting vaccinated, right? As if it's our fault, as if we're supposed to atom, automatically trust institutions that have consistently, unremittingly discriminated against us, exploited us, right? Um, I don't have to tell you about John Cutler and the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Um, you should know John Cutler's name. I don't have to tell you perhaps about J. Marion Sims and the racist gynecological experiments that he did, or Miss Henrietta Lacks, or the Ralph sisters, or Dawn, Nurse Dawn Wooten, or Esmond Green, or Dr. Susan Moore, right? So I want you on this, in thinking about these grant um, proposals and evaluating them, to seriously think about like honoring the, the, the spirits and um, the experiences of folks that are no longer with us, right? What is the thing that you can say, do, interrupt, ask a question about um, that may undo, right? And prevent some awful exploitative research to continue happening. Um, this slide is just a reminder that like lots of black folks are talking about Tuskegee, right? wherein the government never, ever, ever gave syphilis to the African-American men who were in the study, but John Cutler did in Guatemala, right? So that's, that's a different, people say, what about Tuskegee? And I wanna say, no, what about Guatemala STD, right? Let's, let's talk about those. Um, so in these studies, the US government intentionally infected, incarcerated Guatemalan men, or orphans, uh, mentally impaired uh, Guatemalan uh, peoples, sex workers with STIs to test the efficacies of penicillin, right? That was not that long ago, right? It's 2021, not that long ago. I encourage you in your things that uh, Reverend Dr. Phillips and Jeff and Agnes give you to watch La Pracion, right? Which is about uh, sterilization in Puerto Rico, but also No, no Mas Bebes, which is about um, which dovetails over what uh, Norse Dawn Wooten helped us understand that there were hysterectomies being performed in ICE detention. Same thing was happening in LA about 40 years ago in Los Angeles hospitals with Chicano women, right? Same thing happens. I, I don't, I don't want to make the focus just on uh, studies that happen in medical or health institutions, right? That like the things that I want you to also check with the same fervor and love and concern from folks from impacted communities, any educational um, projects that you evaluate too. And you can ask me in the Q&A about Dr. Monique M. Morris and her work on uh, push out and the criminalization of black girls in schools. Okay, Agnes, how am I doing on time? I'm okay? Yes, we're good. All right. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the, the BX Crib, right? The BX Crib is the Bronx Community Research Review Board. And we are a volunteer, intergenerational, multiracial, multi-gender identity group of Bronx residents, researchers, educators, and caregivers that organize like hell to try to make sure that research that's conducted in the borough that we live and work in and love is done fairly, ethically, and will demonstrably, right? I'm, I'm using the word demonstrably because lots of research proposals that you're gonna read, they're gonna say, it's gonna benefit mankind, right? <laughs> it's gonna benefit society. And our question is when? What can this research do to benefit people right now? Yeah, that's great to hear the societal level, long-term thing, 
but what can it do right now to address health equity, our well-being, social and environmental justice? All right. I'm going to talk to you because in a way you are going to you're going to be like BX Crib members when you review these proposals, right? And I want you to think so the way that we engage is we have a website and for a very long time um, Bronx-based researchers would submit their community projects to us, right? And we would evaluate it and we would evaluate it with the lens that we are trying to interrupt exploitative and racist and sexist research, right? Um, you're gonna be doing the same thing um, when you review your, your proposals. Um, more recently, we are getting proposals from like Chicago and New Orleans and Kansas City, Missouri, and all over the world, right? And we're thinking about like how to build our capacity to conduct nationwide evaluations. I just wanna say some things about our work that may help inform your work on the CTSA, right? So we review research in order to transform, transform the culture of research um, from top down to bottom up. So we ask questions like, all right, how much money is this grant gonna get? How much of that is going to go to the community, right? The community does, does not want your Amazon twenty-five dollar Amazon gift card and your pizza. Like, don't come, don't come with no Amazon gift card, no pizza, right? If anything, ask the participants or check in with them through a community dialogue, through a focus group, and ask people what might they want or need for them to be engaged in in, this, in a study. We seek to protect the, the health of um, Bronx residents through community engagement. And I can talk more about what that is. We do that through reviewing research, but we also, again, fight like hell to push researchers to return the findings back to the folks who were in the study as soon as possible. That's something else that I wanna engage you to do, uh, encourage rather you to do when you review these grants. Like, like how are the people who participated in the study, and let's be real, right? If Jazzy and Diane and Koake are participants, Jazzy's family, Diane's family, Koake's family are really other unintended participants in this study. When are they gonna know what you did with their samples, with their interviews, with their survey results? Maybe a question you wanna ask in the grant review process is, how are you going to tell people what you did with whatever you collected from them in a way that makes sense to them. Don't tell me you're gonna write an academic article and send it to them. Don't nobody care about your academic article, okay? Maybe your mama and your people care about your academic article, but most academic articles are not written in ways that are accessible to community members. We insist on the shared ownership and the benefits of the products of research. So when we review research, we ask questions like, who owns the data? Who, if you're partnering, if you in this in your review process hear that some physicians want to partner with young people to build a garden in their school um, to, to attend to food justice. I actually reviewed a study like that for the CTSA, right? Um, who's gonna own the garden when the research is peace out? Right? Who's gonna own, who's gonna have the ability to talk about the project, if that makes sense, right? And then lastly, we do a lot of work around providing healing-centered education. We recognize that participating in research is a humiliating and traumatic experience for lots of communities. So we work through how do we heal from the trauma of that and think about how to conduct research in ways that are not traumatic and harmful. All right, so I, I'm gonna skip through this slide. So like I said before, we have a website. We ask a lot of questions like, what is off limits and sacred? Sometimes I feel like researchers, myself included, want to know a lot about a person, right? But when you do um, long-term research, right? Sometimes the line between Reverend Dr. Phillips as a nurse and a member of the CTSA and the people that she's conducting research with gets blurry, right? Um, we ask questions like what is sacred and what is off limits in uh, the research? Okay, so I wanna talk to you a little bit. I wanna close by talking to you and showing you an example of how we think serious community perspectives, like what they look like in research, right? 
So in 2017 and 2018, we had our own community engaged research academy where this is our motto, where we listened first to Bronx patients before we ever designed this academy, we had listening sessions and community dialogues where we told people, hey, we're doing this research project and we got quarter of a million dollars. Tell us what you wanna learn. Tell us what it should look like. Tell us who should be included and invited, right? Um, that we taught Bronx folks the language and the ethics of research in order to mobilize them to be able to conduct independent research projects without researchers and to infiltrate CTSAs, CRAs, and other things. We introduced the concept of community level participation into research, and we just raised Bronxized awareness. So I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna show you a short video, three and a half minute video about what that looked like. And then I'm gonna ask you some questions about the video, if that's okay. Um, these are just some examples of some topics that we did. Like I said before, Reverend Dr. Phillips came through and she taught us about clinical trials, but we also taught people body mapping and whether or not they should do those ancestry tests. Um, we also taught them about the social determinants of health um, and poetry and letter writing as forms of research. All right, so Agnes, sometimes this video behaves itself and plays and sometimes it wants to jump into another window so I'm gonna hope that it plays from right here. Can you see it? Thank you. Sorry, people like taking pictures of me with my mouth open, all right? So I'm apologize for that in advance. I don't know why that happens.
going to stop it there. And I guess before I continue, I want to ask you, um, what did you think our project was about? Who do you think, can you, who was a researcher and who was a participant? Where were we? You can unmute yourself and ask those things. And answer those things rather. Where were you? You were at Ostos. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Good guess though. Not that far. We went down the block. Down the block from Ostos? Yeah. Oh. Metropolitan, Angelina. Metropolitan Community College. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Good guess. <laughs> And what was the other question? Who, who was a researcher and who was a participant? The participants were members of a group like us. Okay. And the researchers, um, I love that pause. Thank you for that pause. <laughs> that part means the world to me, right? I have some comments in the chat. Uh, Jen Tiffany said everyone, and Diane also said all. Bless. Bless up, right? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I thought it was interesting because, um, you know, you had, you had a diverse, I mean, just looking, it seemed like a diverse group. Um, but what, what really got my attention was the young man, when the video, for some reason, when the young man was expressing himself on the video, and the, uh, the folks in the audience was just really intently looking. The other thing that, um, that drew me was the woman who was speaking about how she gets her food, mm -hmm. like the resources. And that, and that made me think about how people do get their food different ways. Mm -hmm. Some get their food, some people get their food easier because they have better resources that the other person doesn't know about. Mm -hmm. So just by her expressing herself and, and letting everyone know, um, that could help her and that could help also the people watching. So I, I understand how they say everyone, everyone, because everyone is helping everyone by listening. But I also found her to be a researcher because she is explaining and she has, it's like she researched herself. She looked within, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. This is, this is, you know, uh, how I get my food. This is how my children um, get their food. And she becomes a researcher to me as well, because we all are. That's how we that's really how we're able to survive when we don't have anything else. You know, someone is not helping us. We have to look to help ourselves. An example of that is with the uh, the the, uh, the the vaccine for mm. COVID-19. You have many elderly people who don't have computers, who don't know how to use computers, but yet they have to uh, book appointments. Everybody doesn't have a doctor. Right. Okay. So, you know, that's that's an example of where. Um, it's good to know what resources people will have in order to help them in advance. Yeah, thank you both, uh, Jazzy and Angelina. Thank you so much for your comments. So I, I, oh, am, <laughs> I am like energized to hear that you said that it was hard to tell who a researcher was or that everyone in, and all of us were researchers. So just to be clear, yeah, we taught research methods to people and then they immediately started using their research methods, right? They started, they started bringing their kids to sessions that we would hold and saying, you need to learn about this, right? You need to learn about how to map the social determinants of health in your borough, how to write a letter to your senator and congressperson, how to go to a participatory budget meeting and demand that monies be allocated for whatever, whatever. And Angelina's got good eyes to see that we were on 149th Street, right? But Angelina, we were also everywhere. We were in Lincoln, Bronx, Lebanon, Montefiore. At the courthouse. We were, a, we took up space and wrote on the wall of Ruben Diaz's courthouse. We didn't care, mm -hmm. right? We didn't ask the community to come to us. We went to them. We were at Bronx Community College. We were at the zoo. We were at the Botanical Gardens. We were just in the street, if that makes sense to you. Um, and our project is probably an unusual project but I want to say when people talk about honoring community, this is what it should look like, if that made sense to you. I'm, I'm running short on time, Angelina. Uh-huh. I'm sorry, Agnes, I'm running short on time. Uh, we have about time. Uh, 10 minutes or so. Okay, 
I'm, I'm so I'm going to stop so I can have questions. So I would encourage you as in your, in your burgeoning and your new role as evaluators of research um, and uh, in this grant review process to like also ask questions, like I said before, about who is excluded and whose perspectives need to be at the table that is not um, when you're reviewing these projects, right? And is this work happening in a way where it is honoring, loving, holding space for people with dignity? Or is it happening in a way that is disrespectful, continuing to be racist and exploitative, if that makes sense? Yeah, oh, I was gonna, ask, I was gonna show you another video. Um, and I'll just leave this video for Agnes to, um, and Reverend Dr. Phillips to show. Um, if anyone ever tells you that community perspectives are not, can you see my screen still? Thanks. Um, that community perspectives are not important. I want you to, I want you to remind them that um, right after the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, uh, uh, who was president? Uh, Lynn Carter, Carter, yeah, Carter was president, yes. Um, established what's called the Belmont Commission, right? And the Belmont Commission are a group of scientists and non-scientists who establish the ethics language of the land, how research like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, like what happened to the Ralph sisters, like research that happened with incarcerated people and what happened with um, Henrietta Lacks can never happen again. And on that commission were two black women, one who at the time was not a researcher, Dr. Dorothy Height was uh, the founder of the National Council for Negro Women, who is the godmother of the civil rights movement. If you read memoirs from Martin Luther King, from, from uh, Jesse Jackson, from a lot of our civil rights icons, they'll tell you that they couldn't do a damn thing without including Dorothy Height. And I will just um, leave this video for um, them to tell you that it was her on the commission that forced people forced the ethicists and the researchers and the doctors to talk about racism. It was her, but also uh, Dr. Patricia King, who was a lawyer and not a researcher, who was like, this is what y'all finna do when you do research with folks, right? They fought for community perspectives. So if there ever comes a time, and I'm sure Reverend Dr. Phillips, but also Agnes won't let that happen, where some of the researchers get fancy and try to minimize the value and the brilliance of your perspectives when you are reviewing these projects, you just remind them about Dorothy Height and Dr. King. Um, I'm gonna stop there and entertain any questions that you have. Reverend Dr. Phillips told me that I didn't have to go through the research um, review process, but I also have slides for that that you can have next time. Thanks so much for listening to me. As um, everybody shares their questions, would you be able to share the links that you mentioned in the beginning of the class? Yeah, I'm gonna do that right now. Thank you. Dr. Grishad, I just want to thank you for your um, presentation today because it's really resonated and, and intersecting with work or conversations I'm having. I just Tuesday was talking to another, um, she's a grief advisor and talking about my work. And she said, so um, why don't you set up a center or a think tank, like I've been seeing folks doing this research about us. That, and I was like, yes, because I'm focused on research by us, for us, right? For us and by us. And if we're not at the table, it doesn't happen. All research should have the people that they're looking at at the table. And um, so seeing that you, how you will move to an independent space and, and looking at the research and how you approach it and who you, how you, uh, how our community folks begin to learn to be engaged in the process and learn that power is just not by might. We could use our intellectual cognitive might and use our voice as well, as well. And just for that example that you showed us there, I was gonna say what I really appreciated and why I felt all of them were researchers is because you all taught some research methods and then you could see the people really engaging and acting. And so that means just like when they're walking down the street that bodega, that new store, that new look is like, now it's like, oh, well, I noticed this. And they can ask questions and bring it to a space and learn how to use that information and how it influences their life. So that was uh, what was really beautiful to me and important, was an important reminder to us about how we all participate in research.
Yeah, thank you so much for that, Diane. I mean, there's so many things that I can say in response. I will just tell you that right after we had a graduation ceremony, one of the elder um, uh, women that were in the project talked about being at Rite Aid. You know how they got those free um, scales in, in Rite Aid? You just sit down in the pharmacy and you could weigh yourself, right? So she wrote me, she called me on the phone and then she wrote me an email. She was like, you know, I sat on that scale today and I wondered what they doing with my weight data. <laughs> It's yeah. like, what, what is Rite Aid collecting about me? And what are they going to do with it? And so, yeah, that's exactly what happened, Diane. People started sharing about what they were learning on social media, like I said before, bringing their kids. Um, yeah, it generated a lot of conversations about like surveillance and how we need to be involved in research, not just as consultants, but as the people that do it. Dr. Gushard, your presentation was, it's just so fascinating. And I just want to encourage you to keep doing it because the more people in the community understand their true roles and their power in terms of research, there will be no more hesitancy and no more talk of hesitancy because we'll be at the table. Yeah. We'll understand everything from the very, very beginning. Yeah. So I thank you so very much. It, this is just so transformative. Thank you, I appreciate that. And you were a part of that transformation, right? You were, right, we called yeah, around. Man. Yeah, we called around to a lot of doctors and said, we need someone to- Yeah, jump your move. My, I didn't hear a thing, my computer's a clear. I didn't hear a thing either. I was saying that we called around to a lot of <laughs> physicians that we knew because we wanted someone to talk about clinical trials, right? And talk about clinical trials in a way that regular people could understand it. And we, me and you had our back and forth, but you yeah. have always been so generous of your time um, to just show up and, and be in community and not in a fancy pretentious way, but in a, in a way that people, are, keep, people keep referencing what they learned from you about clinical trials three years ago. Wow, that, that's, that's heartwarming. But one of the things I just, I realize the, the role that the Bronx Crib has. Mm -hmm. It is so important to people in the community. They, it's just so empowering and it's so educating. Mm -hmm. It pulls the veneer off of research it does. and makes it a plain language and that's important. <laughs> yeah, language is, a, is used as a tool to, like I said before, to create distance and for folks not to engage. And like, I have to tell, uh, I don't have to tell Paulette this, but I have to tell Jazzy, Mia, Jeresha, Kowake, Jennifer, Francie, Angelina, and Donna this, right? Like, I have three master's degrees, right? <laughs> I have a PhD. And sometimes I've sat through at the CTSA in Wild Cornell, or I'm also on Albert Einstein College of Medicine's uh, ICTR, a similar thing, a, a translational science center. And people talk in, in alphabet soup. Don't, don't researchers love to talk about alphabet soup? ACOE or whatever, like as if we know what they're talking about. And there are times that I have to say, if, if I have all these goddamn degrees and I don't know what the hell you're talking about, you don't know what the hell you're talking about either. Talk to me in ways that make sense. Talk to me in a way that respects me and that invites me to be involved in the conversation, right? Um, it's something that happens if you, whether you have a PhD or a, a public high school diploma, right? It's something that happens particularly to black and brown bodies, right? We have like six minutes, but I- Hi, to I'd like to, may I make a comment? Sure, Francie. Thank you. It was exactly March of 2019 that I made a visit to Mott Haven mm -hmm. to take some pictures. Mm -hmm. While there, quite unexpectedly, I came upon about 40 families, mostly from Ghana, mm -hmm. but as well, many other African nation states. They had bought their entire household mm. 
to learn the process to access equity to buy their own homes mm. in that area. Mm. So I asked a couple of the seeming heads of households, men and women, I was fascinating, fascinated that they bought their children. Some were as young as three, mm -hmm. 16, I remember, 19, 12, 11. And they all said to me, almost with one voice, this is our future. Mm -hmm. And they said that with hope, not a burden. Yeah. The future belongs to the brave. Mm -hmm. Those who view the future as a burden take the wrong spirit mm -hmm. from the past. Mm -hmm. It is the future that is the promise mm -hmm. of the past that was not realized. Mm -hmm. And to get the absolute positive sucker of the future, mm -hmm. the spirit, must be bold, humble, as you said, yeah. and also appreciative. It's never a burden. The future is the promised land. And yeah. it is here if we take the right spirit mm -hmm. and embrace the absolute promise mm -hmm. of the land we make. Mm -hmm. And that land if I understood your lecture, mm -hmm. is rooted in the gravitas of the research that comes up from the earth mm -hmm. that is not superimposed, as you said earlier, from the top down, springs organically and authentically mm -hmm. for real out of the people who engage other, again, never with the spirit a burden with the spirit of the promise of mm -hmm. the future that is today and tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate that, Francie. If there was a, like a symbol that the, pre, the BX script, I mean, obviously the Bronx and, and we acknowledge, like I, I should have said in the beginning that I, like I'm the vice chair of the Bronx Community Research Review Board, but we are in our feelings about using the settler colonial name for the unceded territories of the Munche Lenape peoples, right? Um, so I, I will say that I appreciate what you said because sometimes it feels so disempowering. Sometimes it feels distressing. Sometimes it feels depressing. Like when we realize the structures that we are up against, right? And like I said before, the BX crib is like right now we have like 16 core members, but our network is like 180 people, but 16 core on the ground members, like Francie, we don't all have the same theory of change. You know what I mean? We do share an idea. We do share a belief that white supremacist, imperialist, capitalist, patriarchal research is not going to live forever. Like that, like that is our core belief. It's going to die, <laughs> right? Like that is the thing that holds us together. Some of us try to do that by shaking the table. I am, the Reverend Dr. Phyllis will tell you, I'm a shake the tabler, right? Others of us, we haunt spaces, right? So like if I go to a meeting and we're talking about LGBTQIA peoples and there ain't no LGBTQI folks there or trans folks or non-binary folks, I'm gonna haunt the space. And I'm gonna say like, wait, like, wait, where they at? Did they get an invitation or whatever? And some of us, because we're shyer or we're more reserved, are more like the quiet checker. Y'all know what I mean, the quiet checkers, right? The person that doesn't say, I'm sure some of y'all are some quiet checkers, that doesn't say anything all meeting. And then at the end, like Miss like Francie did, drops a jewel and then walks away, right? But the important, the importance is that we need multiple theories of change for us to create change and, and the core theory of change, as you so eloquently said, is a belief that racism the, in the, the impermanence of racism, right? It's gonna die, it's gonna die. It doesn't look like it right now, it's, it's gonna die. And that research is gonna be conducted in ways that are restorative and affirming and healing to impacted people. Amen. <laughs>
I say. Say that again. <laughs> I say. I agree. Say <laughs> so it will be. Yes, well, thank you so much be. for letting me spend some, the afternoon with you. Oh, thank you so much for sharing with us. Right. And we will be in touch. Beautiful. Keep shaking the table. I will. Because you know what? The table needs shaking. It does. It does. <laughs> Thank, it you. does. Thank you. No worries. Take care of yourself. Okay. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.